Good afternoon, my name is Gary Scudder and I am a professor here in the core. Today I want to talk a little bit about a subject which I know a little bit about but not nearly enough about and a subject I'm trying to teach myself more about and that is how one would teach feminist literary criticism. Uh, this is one of the lenses that we use in the Heroines and Heroes class, Core 270. Uh, as we talked about before in this class, it's a class where you are examining your hero or heroine, and we look at them through lenses like psychoanalytical criticism or Marxist literary criticism, gay and lesbian literary criticism, and feminist literary criticism. And, you know, and one of the uh, challenges of the core is that you're always teaching yourself. It's one of the blessings and curses of the core is you're always sort of like expanding your horizons all the time. And um, I actually like uh, this approach because I, one, I love literature and I feel that I now am a much more sophisticated reader of literature even at my advanced age uh, because of this class. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today about how I use feminist literary criticism, how I approach it in Heroes and Heroes. First off, like I've said several times in other core talks, what I always do is wrap, I always give every literary lens two days, which I wrap around the weekend. So the second meeting of the class in a week, say it's a Tuesday, Friday class, on Friday I will introduce the literary theory and we'll actually get into the Barry book. And then the first meeting of the following week, say it's a Tuesday, Friday class, so the following Tuesday, that is when they owe me a paper. And it's always on some short story. It's a three-page paper. It can be longer, but we're saying three-page paper. And they have to analyze a short story that I have chosen specifically with that lens. And obviously, I go out of my way to pick out short stories which fit in very nicely, uh, which you could use some analysis, but always more complex than the students realize. Okay. With feminist literary criticism, I use the amazing Jhumpa Lahiri story in from Interpreter of Maladies, A Temporary Matter, which is an absolutely devastating short story. The, the entire collection, Interpreter of Maladies, is a great, great short story collection. The only problem it has is it makes the fundamental mistake that you make with mixtapes for your boyfriend or girlfriend. You never have the first, the best song first. And the first short story in the collection is A Temporary Matter, which is a transcendently good story. She should have had it like third or fourth, or last in a classic sort of mixtape philosophy. But beyond that, it's an amazing, an amazing story. Now, first off, how do I approach this? Well, okay, so it's the Friday, uh, the second meeting, the first time I'm going to approach it, and we're getting into the Barry book. You know, and Barry's nice because he sort of at the beginning lays out the history of the evolution of the theory. And along the way, he gives us some very specific rules to follow. And usually about halfway through the chapter, he starts talking as if we're all in graduate school. And that's why I usually tell my students, okay, you can stop reading then. Because he's no longer talking to you. He's talking to you as if you're like working in your MA or PhD. So if it doesn't make any sense, that's okay. You can stop now. He's given you the tools that you need for this level. And, uh, you know, what I normally do is I don't like to jump right into it, so I'll start off with some little hook. And with feminist literary criticism, I usually just introduce the concept of Simone de Beauvoir and the second sex and the one and the other. And some of them have heard of this and some of them have not. And I usually lay it out very quickly and I talk about the notion of what this might mean. You know, and her point is not that men should be the one and women should be the other, but society as it's constructed tends to be that way. And occasionally you'll get students who will say, well, you know, that doesn't apply anymore because we're so beyond gender. Which usually leads the more sophisticated students to laugh uproariously and throw things at them as they should. And realize it's much more complex. And even if you ask something as simple as, so how many of the women in the room are going to get married? You know, and some of them raise answer. So are you going to take your husband's name? And half of them will say, yes, okay, okay you've now identified yourself as the other. And immediately that starts a big fight, which is sort of the point. You're trying to get them to understand that we are not actually living in a post-gender world. Okay. Then he gives us some nice tools to work with. And some of them are pretty basic. Uh, this is Barry, again, he always lays them out. Like, number one is rethink the canon. Uh, what is the canon, the traditional canon of Western literature? What do you do with it? And if you say rethink the canon, does this mean that you want to artificially put women writers in, or do you want to say, should we take out some of the male writers who should not be in there, or do we look specifically at female writers who were kept out of the canon because they were female writers, 
or God forbid, you just want to have a separate female canon because I don't think that sort of defeats the purpose. And it actually starts a big fight, which is okay because that's what you want. You want them to think about the fact that these are not just dry, boring, dusty subjects. These are subjects which really mean something. And along the way, I tend to open up a website which shows Harold Bloom's The Western Canon List, and we sort of stroll down it. And except for Sappho, who's buried somewhere in a sentence, you don't really hit any women writers until you get literally to about the 18th century. And I don't want to sit there and, you know, dump on Harold Bloom, because I think his book, The Western Canon, is quite brilliant. But it sort of opens up this question. Uh, to revalue women's experience, to look at the female experience in literature. I tend to also do this a lot in film. Uh, examine representations of women in literature by men and women. And this is, if you want to start a really good discussion, ask the students this. Do you think that it is harder or easier for a man, a male author to write a female character or for a female author to write a male character? That always starts a big fight. And inevitably, if the students say something like, well, I think it's probably easier for a female author to write a male character, then you can take it a couple different ways. One, so you say then, so you agree with Simone de Beauvoir that it's easier to write the male character because he is the one. Or are you essentially saying that women have some sort of mystical power and some mystical knowledge which makes them above the ability of poor stupid men to write, which of course is also essentially true because we were more sort of evolutionarily challenged. So you, you use these ways to sort of get, tweak their attention. Uh, number four, from the Barry List, challenge representations of women as other, again, getting back to Simone de Beauvoir. Examine power relationships. This is a classic thing in literature. Uh, six, recognize the role of language in making what is social and constructed seem transparent. So in what ways does language itself Define sort of uh, sort of socially constructed mores. Uh, seven raised the question of whether men and women are essentially different because of biology or socially constructed. That's a good fight, especially because then, since this class is taught in the second year, you can harken back to concepts of the self and bring in the pumpkin book and talk about the fact that if male and female brains are slightly different, and then the fight begins. Uh, question the notion of a female language. Um, nine, reread psychoanalysis to explore the issue of female and male identity. Ten is a classic question, the death of the author. And this is something the students actually find quite fascinating. Because uh, on the one hand, they, they are almost oddly, naturally, genetically deconstructionalist. Uh, they sort of like the notion in their own strange way that it's kind of funny that it doesn't matter what the author wanted. Uh, what matters is what we interpret from the author. So they're kind of deconstructless. And, and then I will say, okay, if this is true, how many of you write? How many of you are artists? And, you know, amazingly, about a quarter of the students always raise their hand. And then you just say, is it important to you that I understand what you're doing? Oh, yes. Okay, so it's important for you, it's just not important for Shakespeare. So that sort of gets them thinking about what this means. And also this notion that with the death of the artist, that we are just, the artists are not creative forces as much as they're just products of their environment. Uh, that if you're Francis Bacon, the reason why your paintings are so messed up is because you had such a horrible childhood and because your father beat you. Or are we going to determine that you're a, uh, that a woman writer writes a certain way simply because she's a female writer? So the death of the artist is something that really starts a big fight with them. Um, and then 11, make clear the ideological base of supposedly neutral or mainstream literary interpretations. And all of these, are, I think, are kind of interesting. Now. How do I approach it? So this is the first day, and I show a bunch of stuff, and I, you know, I bring in, um, what do I bring in? I, I bring in stuff from uh, the Pello book, that uh, collection that was written in Japan about a thousand years ago, uh, written by a Japanese woman who lived at the Central Court, and her observations on life there. And for instance, this is one of them. Uh, this is one of the things that she wrote. This is Say Shonagon, and she wrote, and again, this is a thousand years ago in Japan. She said, she wrote, when I make myself imagine what it's like to be one of those women who live at home faithfully serving their husbands, women who have not a single exciting prospect in life, yet who believe that they are perfectly happy, I am filled with scorn. And you think, okay, how many women could write exactly the same thing across the street in Vermont here? 
So this is this notion of sort of reevaluating and examining what women have written over the years and maybe have been forgotten. So that always works very well. And I did that. And also this last time I brought in some stuff from the Persian epic, uh, the Shahnameh, mainly because I was working on it right then in research. But I brought in a couple of the female characters and talked about the things that they were expressing in this Persian epic. So I just tend to give them things to think about. Okay, now before we meet the next time, they have to write a three-page paper examining a temporary matter. For those of you who don't know the story, it's a great story. Uh, it is about this couple who are in the midst of a failing relationship. They've been married a couple of years and they're sort of playing out the string now, though I think he has delusions that they might not. Um, they've just had a horrible experience where about six months earlier they had lost a child. The child was still born, and this was their only child they ever had. And even though they could technically have kids again, they never quite get around to it. And they live in this very strange life where suddenly you have this almost complete transformation of gender roles going to that moment of the, of the stillborn of the child. And now uh, Shukumar, the male character who's allegedly finishing his doctorate, who never quite gets around to it, um, tends to spend all day long in, the, in their apartment and never leaves. And Shoba, his wife, um, now is gone all the time, is continually making excuses and taking on more jobs so she's never home. And you have a sort of strange role reversal. And in the evening, it's clear that he's doing everything he can to avoid spending time with her. He, and literally, after the birth of the baby, he moves his office to what would have been the nursery. And because he knows that she will not come in there. And which brings up discussion of, you know, is he just being cruel? Are we saying this because we have certain expectations about the male role and things? So, I mean, they're, they're fascinating characters. And in the end, you sort of learn this terrible secret. Now, along the way, they, um, they discovered that there's going to be an electric, uh, electricity outlet every night. So about every night for about an hour, the electricity is going to go out. And uh, Shukumar has this idea, I mean, Shoba has this idea, well, what, you know, what I have to do in India, because she has more experience, she's, they're sort of second generation Indian. And she has more experience with India than, than he does. And she says, you know, back home, when the electricity would go out, we would tell each other stories. So why don't we do that? And it sort of sets up this very lovely plot point. So for five straight nights, when the electricity goes out, they share a secret. And what the students, when I sort of write them on the board, the students really realize that the secrets are completely paired. They're equal. So for instance, the first night, they essentially share funny stories about when they first met. She says, by the way, on our first date, you were talking to your mom on the phone, and I went in and looked through your address book because I wanted to see if I was in there, if I was featured, which is a very funny first date thing to admit to. And he admits to her, well, you know, after the first date, I was so crazy mad in love with you already that I forgot to pay the tip. So I literally had to take a taxi back out to the restaurant the next day to pay the tip. So they're sort of funny, charming stories. Now the next night, they actually admit the first time that they told a lie to each other. For instance, um, Shoba admits that when his mother was visiting one time, she made up an excuse for why she couldn't be home, and instead she went out and had a drink with her close friend, because she didn't really spend time with his mother. Uh, and he admits, Chukumar does in a very interesting way, that he cheated on an oriental civilization exam, which is kind of funny, because He's from India. And so she already, in a sense, we're talking about his failure, his failure to finish his dissertation, his failure to do all these things. Or for that matter, the fact he was not even home uh, for the birth of the baby, he was off at a conference. So in very fact, he fails his own Oriental Civilization exam as classic. So they admit some lies. And the third night, they admit essentially what is embarrassment. Um, Shukumar admits that um, he had received a sweater from Shoba that he hated so much that he told her he lost it, but actually he went back to the store, returned it, took the money, and went to a bar in the middle of the afternoon and got drunk. She admits that one time when she was mad at him, uh, they were at a public lecture, and after the lecture he was holding forth to the chair of his department, he had a big blob of pate on his chin, and she could have told him, but she didn't because she was mad at him and she had this sort of schadenfreude at his embarrassment. So they're admitting a sort of embarrassment with each other. By the time we get to the fourth night, it's, it's getting darker. Um, he admits 
that when she was pregnant, uh, he cut out a picture from one of her fashion magazines of this beautiful woman and kept it in his wallet for weeks on end. And once a day, he'd take it out and look at it. And he even admits that it's the closest he ever came to being unfaithful to her. And she admits that his one published poem, she hated. So suddenly we're getting a little darker. And it's also nice because this is where we start getting into sort of gender understanding. The fact that we have certain expectations. And one is, as a man, you're going to be more serious about your career. So the very fact that his one poem she hates gets into our perception of why we think this is hateful. Or the fact that she, as a woman, is going to be fascinated by her own looks. And she's pregnant and he's taking a picture of another woman who's more attractive. So it gets into our perception about why do we think this is so damning. By the time we get to the fifth night, uh, what she says to him is this. I'm moving out. And it's devastating to him because he thinks, so all this time that we've been having this conversation, you've already known this. And they actually make love after the fourth night. And so this is this amazing deception. And you think, well, that's it. I mean, how can he top this? And then he says this to her, that actually when he came back from the conference, he received a call that she was in the hospital in labor. And by the time he got back, the baby was dead. And... Shoba had not wanted to know anything. She did not want to know the sex of the baby at all. And what Shukumar says is this. He goes, after this horrible realization where she says, I'm leaving, he says this to her. Our baby was a boy, he said. His skin was more red than brown. He had black hair on his head. He weighed about five pounds. His fingers were curled shut, just like yours in the night which is one of the most devastating things I could think of from any short story. And the students are immediately like, gosh, is he just being cruel? Or do we think he's being cruel because he's the man? Or is he just trying, you know, she has shared a terrible secret and he is sharing this and they can't move on. You know, they can't move on until he knows that she is leaving and she really can't move on until he knows this and so he shared this. It's also interesting about the notion, I always ask my students, it's like, who owns the baby? Because, you know, this is, again, all these gender expectations. And one of them is that when a woman is pregnant, she owns the baby. It's not until it comes out that suddenly the man, her husband, goes, oh, wait a minute, so this is why you gained all this weight. So it's like it's not even a reality. So in a sense, she owned the baby up until that time. But when the baby died, in a way, oddly, then Shukumar owns the baby. He owns the memory. He owns the secret of the baby, which she never knew. So when you think about some of the things that Barry lays out, uh, the question of social construction of the main characters, and for that matter, the authors themselves, the question of the death of the author, um, the notion of how one represents a character. So one of the most interesting things about the story is that Lahiri is a female author, but she tells the story from the perspective of the male character, which allows the female character to remain much more mysterious. And we always ask ourselves whether or not she does a good job with him. Is she fair with him? The question of power relationships is huge with this. Because until that very final moment, she seems to be the one who always has the power. Even down to the fact that every night, he now cooks every night because she has stopped cooking. But he cooks only using her recipes. And at the last moment, he shares this. And the question is, is he giving power back to her, or is this the ultimate power grab? The students love this story. They find it pretty devastating. Um, I think it works remarkably well with feminist literary criticism. And if anyone would like to talk more about this, I would be more than happy to. So thanks a lot.